in the main Zoom room. Uh, this is uh, the workshop that Rabbi Deborah is going to be uh, uh, presenting for us. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction, as she alluded to uh, in her remarks earlier this morning as well, um, she, back in 2016, I don't know that she really wanted to anticipate the challenges that we're facing now, but you know, because of her uh, strong feelings for the fact that resilience is sort of a, a central focal point for the Jewish people, she clearly had some foresight and, and sort of was ahead of the wave, if you will, but wanting to uh, make sure that resilience was uh, something that was a part of our dialogue, a part of our thinking. And uh, so it was with that that she, um, among other things, uh, started a podcast called Hashibainu. And I'm not going to get into it because I know she will, but I just wanted to welcome her back. Tell her that we are, uh, again, so privileged and happy that she uh, will take this hour with us and uh, share our uh, some thinking and, and hopefully engage us. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks so much, George. And just checking, it's an hour, not 75 minutes. I, I should aim to end at two? Yeah. Super. We okay. aim to end at two. Great. Absolutely. I can make that happen. No problem. Um, so again, it's such a blessing to be with you. And it's true. It's, it's true that I, I think I started talking about resilience, as I said this morning, right away. Um, and, and that actually, and, and I, I think it makes so much sense that others have, um, you see that language all the time now. Uh, I, I think it, it's, it, it's just very apt for this, this moment full of challenge, this extended season full of challenge. As I said, for me, <laughs> it really em emerged shortly after the last election. I think that, uh, I remember in, in, in February of 2017, I was on the first of many protests that I've been with. Uh, it was, a, there was the, I, I marched with Trua, the uh, rabbinic call for human rights, and we were marching uh, it was shortly after the inauguration, then we were marching, it was in New York City, we were marching to the Trump International Hotel to protest immigration policies. And I remember saying to Rabbi Shai Held, who is one of the leaders of Hadar, we were walking together back in that, those days where you would walk with, in a group of people and with, with, with someone. And I said, I, I feel, I think I called up this image earlier, I feel like I am standing in the midst of wreckage. That, you know, I was born in 1967, which is I think really significant like for Jews around the, the Six Day War and at the kind of the apex I think of a post-World War II liberal consensus that was, um, you know, was, was I thought I would have thought five, 10 years ago was holding up reasonably well, even as it was creaking in certain places. And I remember saying to, to, to Shai, you know, it is all come tumbling down and we have to figure out what do we want to, um, salvage from the wreckage and what are new materials that we have to bring in to erect uh, whatever is coming next. And so I think that, you know, here we are at, at, at um, Martin Luther King's birthday will be celebrated on Monday. And he had that extraordinary, you know, such a such an eloquent uh, and, and prophetic speaker and writer and his line that the arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. And that, um, you know, that feeling like the, that recognition, that wondering is that the period in which I grew up and where I was shaped, was that not just a part of that trajectory toward justice, but was it perhaps an aberration of, of such plenitude, such plenty and such peacefulness? And where, what is, where, where are we re-entering a moment so much more like the rest of Jewish history for sure and, and world history, which is full of strife and illness and, and, and um, uh, and, 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 and disruption. And I think, you know, I think I felt it just as a attuned and um, publicly minded person. And I certainly felt it as a Jew and I felt it as a woman and I felt it as a lesbian and all these, and I felt it as a progressive, all these ways where I felt um, at risk and anxious and concerned. And, you know, for, I, I, as, as the framing of your retreat uh, suggests this is not, uh, this has been accelerating rather than um, diminishing. And, and I do, as I said earlier, I, I do really find that orienting myself toward resilience as a mindset and more to the point, taking on resilience practices because um, resilience can, it's like a muscle and it can be built up. 
and it can help us that that has been that that helps to shift me from my darker perseverations, my 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 more more anxious fretting, and it helps to really kind of orient me toward practices that um, just give me so much more energy in order to do the work that I think needs to be done. Um, so and, and that that incredible realization that this was deeply deep, like that this that the, that the Jewish living that Jewish that there's so much of Jewish wisdom and so much of Jewish practice is oriented ex exactly toward this that our ancestors across generations had lived through intense insecurity multiple catastrophes and they had again and again found ways to build community to experience joy to cultivate holiness to practice generosity and to create nourishing culture and so that you know that this is this is what I'm choosing to um, to focus on and to raise up and to amplify where we put our attention tends to uh, multiply and I want to put my attention to those things that are generative and for myself and connect me to others. So I have been exploring um, uh, resilience through the podcast and through writings and I have been given some keynotes on it and I and I teach it in congregations, mostly reconstructionist congregations and also in uh, in the wider world, um, a lot of different places, but most especially at, at, at J Street, um, I've been teaching it. So um, so but but the most sustained exploration has been through Hashivenu, um, which we, we I conceptualized it in January 2017 and we launched it in late summer of that year. The first episode. The first episode was for Shabbat. The second was for the high, for Chuva for the on Chuva for the high holidays. And what's astonishing about uh, it is that the issues, the episodes are evergreen. That people keep going to them. So that first Shabbat episode has been downloaded about six thousand times. And the um, usually when when every episode when it when it's first released has about two thousand listens. But the longer it's uh, it's in the in the in the podcast realm, the more people. So I keep hoping that something's going to break through and go viral. But these numbers are, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with these numbers. And the high holiday episodes that we've done every year are ones that get um, listened to a great deal. The uh, the after the Shabbat and the high holidays episodes, um, the the other two, it's kind of worth raising up. Um, one is, um, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, one is about love and focusing on centering love. And the other is, is a titled Choosing Life. And it was a live episode. We recorded it at convention. And so we had, um, I, I conducted an interview and then we had questions. And it was with a member of our board, Susan Levine, and who had, um, tr who had attempted suicide and had, um, thank God, had not succeeded. And, uh, and more challengingly emerged from that episode um, as a double amputee. And she talks about how she chooses life every single day, um, and that episode actually um, has has been broadcast, has been um, shared uh, well beyond the Jewish community um, in different uh, communities where people are talking about preventing suicide. So what I want to do, um, and we're going to stay in, in in plenary, and we have I'm looking, we have about 37 folks in the room. So um, what I want to do is um, bring to you. Uh, three overarching observations that I have, um, uh, the conclusions I've drawn from reviewing the 40 episodes that we've already recorded. We're starting to record the new season now, took a hiatus this fall. Um, and um, I wanna share three insights. And after each one, I want to just open it up a little bit for, um, for, for, for you to, for individuals to share, is there a way that this is you that you've um, you've found that you've been able to cultivate resilience um, through the lens that I'm going to bring? And then the last part of our 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 session, I'm going to actually invite you to engage in a in a gratitude practice with me, something that perhaps you might want to take on as a way to build up a, a sense of resilience. Um, so these um these overarching observations, and I'll I'll share my screen now. Um, I bet you it's in the wrong place. Yep, we get a, a preview of what is. I'll start the slideshow. Um, these um, observations are not exactly um, earth shattering. They are, they're not like blinding 
um, insights. Uh, what they are is, um, I, I just find there, it's, um, I just wanna make it so I can look at my notes. Um, the, so the first one, oops, the first one is, um, I so don't want my two screens to be doing what they're doing. The first one is that um, ritual provides structure and helps to create meaning. Um, if, if Jewish life is, uh, I have got to get it so I can see my notes. Rabbi, if you, if you click on display settings at the top, you can then choose to only display one page to us, but have both for you. Okay, are you, what, are you seeing? Are you just seeing the screen or are you seeing my notes? You're seeing both? Seeing your, notes, seeing your notes as well. So if you click on display settings, you can switch the displays. You are so wonderful. Thank you. I've actually I, never... I learned this yesterday. <laughs> so passing it on. Display settings. I'm not. You know what I also can just, let me just, the other thing I can just do is just print my notes. We and... don't see your full notes. We just see your mind slide and then the next slide. Oh, super. That's just fine. You don't see my word. No, no, we just see the one slide and then it says next slide and that's okay. all I see at least. That's great, Jerry. That's great. I don't mind if you see my notes, but it's just, um, you know, it's I just- dis uh, Display it's settings is right in the middle at the top, right in the middle of the three options at the top is display settings. That's just fine. That's just fine. I don't mind that. And and, and, and again, you can, I, I don't- oh. If you have two monitors, switch to monitors. I'm so sorry. I, this is the, how amazing that we can be together and how irritating that um, this, that we have to, take up time doing this. I'm going to just, um, I'm just going to print um, my, my, my notes and then, then I don't have to worry about it. Um, uh, and, and I use, I'll recycle them so that it's not too wasteful. So, so to get to, to diving in, like what are the things, Hashi Dana was organized, it's mostly uh, a one-on-one -on -one, um, conversation. Um, and when I bring guests on, I ask them to say, I ask them to think about Let's make it so that the listeners feel like it's, uh, they're listening in on a really, really good conversation. Um, and which is invariably what happens. I have to, I'll, I'll share with you, I have to do a little bit of that because it's usually rabbis. It's, uh, it's often, if it's not rabbis, it's academics um, or public speakers. And I really want it to be, uh, of course I'm out of paper. <laughs> I really want it to be a conversation um, and rabbis and teachers, we can go on for a long, long time. Um, but oftentimes the, the wisdom that they have to bring is like there's some kind of ritual approach that they're doing, whether it's a high like it's a holidays or whether it's Shabbat or whether it's a focus on a part of the liturgy. And, you know, so when we know that Jewish life is so full of prescribed rituals, which I want to be really clear, you know, that works for some people and not for other people. And, um, and, and, and as a reconstructionist, we're really committed to this understanding that there are a lot of different ways to be Jewish and, and, and we wanna make space for people to really lean in to those things that work for them and not feel overly obligated around those things that don't work for them. I mean, there are ways that we push the obligation, like show up in Minyan, um, you know, show up when, when someone is mourning, show up for them. But, but there are other ways that, um, oh, it looks like Melody would like to go to a different group if, if someone can help her get there. Um, but so, to, to, but 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 there's no obligation if kashrut really doesn't work for you, or if prayer doesn't work for you, that that you must do that in order to be a good Jew or an authentic authentic Jew. That said, um, the, the 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 psychological literature suggests that committing to at least a handful of regular practices of regular rituals. Um, sometimes it's a, it's, it's, it's a one-off and something that it, you need to help you navigate a particular moment, like, um, uh, you know, um, that tragic moment of disconnecting someone from life support. Or I think that one of the, like um, uh, a ritual, I haven't yet seen it, but something I've been thinking about creating of, when you're accompanying a loved one to the so the hospital or to the doctors right now, and you can't go in with them because of the, the challenges of this moment, like wh what 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 is the what is the blessing? What is the what is the thing you can anchor um, yourself to kind of um, help 
ground yourself more in that liminal moment. So sometimes the ritual that we might turn to is 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 just a one time thing. Or I, you know, I I said a blessing for voting before I, I voted by mail, but we said a bless a blessing for voting as we filled out our mail ballots. So that they are just one offs. Or sometimes, and and this is what we're going to end with. It's about a commitment to a daily practice around gratitude. So I want to pause for a second. I mean, I find that engaging in in, a, in 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 rituals and in regular practice helps me to kind of raise my consciousness out of my own preoccupations and helps to connect me to both a, a often a real community, you know, you and your faces. Um, and and your and what you're doing, what you're going through, and also helps to orient me toward a wider worldview, and to remember that there is more than just whatever I am feeling at this moment. That it, that is transitory, and I can remember that, and I can commit myself to that. So I'll pause before I go on to lesson two, and just ask. I'll stop sh um, sharing the screen so we can see each other's faces more. Um, anybody want to share about uh, an experience of? committing to a ritual or some kind of practice that helps reinforce a sense of wellness and helps um, orient toward possibility rather than toward anxiety or a narrow mindset. You are all muted, so you, I invite you to take yourself off of mute if you want to share. So I'll just add that luckily my yoga studio went to all Zoom last April and um, uh, it was wonderful that I could keep up with my routine three days a week yoga. That that kept the wellness in me. For me too, that's been really, really essential. With mixed results, like I'm, I am so much more disciplined when I go to class and I've done some Zooming. What I find especially powerful about the yoga practice is how embodied it is. And that, that the, especially when we are living, I mean, I live like my, where I before had the pandemic I traveled between 50 and 70 percent of every month and I and I that was that there were there was some fatigue associated with that and I loved the diversity the, the variety of my day and my life is confined to this room and feels like it's so often confined to this this experience mm -hmm. and the embodiment of a practice like yoga is so important to me Dan well, I think the, the thing for me is I think that, that so much over the last several years and this past year, we get stuck in anxiety and listening to the news continuously and ritual, whatever kind, whether it's um, just saying uh, Anila Dodi, Vidodi lead to your partner or Shabbat or a blessing or something takes you out of that moment. Well, for that moment, it takes you out of the continuous stress of anxiety and um, and turning the TV off or the news off or something. So for me, ritual does that. So essential. When, when I teach, when I'm teaching expressly on ritual, I describe or, or when I'm helping, I don't do this so much as the president anymore because my, my work tends more toward this kind of thing. But when I'm sitting with some someone or or, or a, couple or a family creating a ritual, I'll describe it as a doorway. Um, you know, what rituals do is help us to sanctify liminal moments. And by liminal, it means like transitional, full of anxiety, full of the unknown. And so, Danny, what you're describing is that we're kind of living in that space all of the time. And ritual is a doorway that helps us to move from that one space through the unknown into another space. And so I think you're exactly right that it does help us to, um, to anchor and to um, center where we are. And, 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 to, and I, I agree with you, like the obsession about the news. And I, I mean, I, for me, it's the New York Times app and I have to just get myself off of it. The, the other thing I'll just say is um, there is something about the restrictions that we're currently living under where every day is the same, that there are so there's so little distinction between work and home now and in the home between 
work and non-work. And, and I've just heard so many people say, it is hard to, lose, to keep track of the days. It is hard to know what day it is. And I, we have just found that lighting Shabbat candles and, and setting up our space for Shabbat has been, it's always been important to us, but it is more important than it ever has been to really make that distinction between, between Kodesh and Chol, between holy and non-holy, because there's no, there's no distinction at this moment. I'm so, so honored that there's more than one screen's worth of people, and I, but I, I'm, so I'm toggling back and forth. If somebody else wants to speak, um, just unmute yourself and begin. I'm, I'm looking to see. Well, I, I was it, interesting, it, Diane, and I was just going to say the same thing, that the, the framing of the days by having um, the ritual of Shabbat occur helps to give some rhythm to the week that you're missing without it. Yeah, absolutely. Mary. So um, I found that during these days of COVID that it's been good for me, um, besides my morning prayer uh, and like what I do at night as part of the bedtime Shema, because there's always some gratitude there to that around noontime and around like five o'clock in the afternoon, I just, you know, for a while I would set an alarm on my phone and now I just kind of find it in the day to stop and to come up with a gratitude and then to kind of like imagine sending that gratitude and love out into the world wherever it's needed. And that's really, really helped me. Uh, although my husband will say not all the time with the anxiety, but that it, you know, for me, I've grounded in, grounded it in, in, things that I know that, you know, are set in the day, like being with the cycle of the hours of the day has helped me. That's so great. And that's exactly, we're gonna, we're gonna end with a gratitude practice. Um, I mean, I, 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 what I've done, I often do like the, some version of the framing that I did in services this morning, and then we do some kind of practice. And so uh, for a morning practice, we'll do gratitude. I have a bedtime practice. I am a lifelong insomniac and to ritualize bedtime has been really important. And, and so I have, I have probably seven or eight different practices, a, a breathing practice based on Elohim and Shema. And, I, and, and when I was reviewing them, which one did I want to share with you? It's the gratitude one that I, I most wanted to bring. So I, let's actually, if, if unless, I'd like to switch to the lesson number two, unless there's anyone else who wants to talk about. One last comment on ritual. Eileen, I, 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 I see you. Here I, so the Shabbat candles for a long time, but during COVID, we finally started doing the ritual of lighting them on Friday nights. And the other thing, before I go to sleep every night, I realize that it's such a blessing that I am able to put my head on my own pillow. We just lost our third relative to COVID. And I realized that this could take any of us at any time. So just going through that ritual of thanking God for letting me sleep in my own bed and praying that I get to the vaccine, which I got the first one this week. Oh, so I feel like I'm starting to see more and more people getting the vaccine that we're, the light at the end of the tunnel is there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there will, be, there will be some lasting trauma and to be able to orient toward that is so huge. There, on Ritual Well, there, I'll see if I can find it before we, we break apart. From each, we, we, before we disperse, there's um, a blessing for when you get the vaccine to, to kind of sanctify that moment. So Eileen will have the last word on this oh. and, 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 and then we'll move on to the next. I'll make it really quick. One ritual that our extended family has and Dan and Mary Reed are in my extended family um, is that we have um, a family Zoom on Friday night and um, it's our large extended family and it's been a beautiful ritual. So we had, had our 44th uh, family Zoom. And without, um, if it was in pre-COVID times, we wouldn't be doing this and I wouldn't be seeing people who don't live uh, nearby. And I've been able to see them every Friday night. Um, and it's just been beautiful and the children are there and um, we all talk, we, you know, we have fun. Um, we eventually get to Friday night, um, Kiddush, candle lighting Kiddush and Hamosi, but we just, it's a really, really powerful and, and relaxing and joyful ritual that we have in our family. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. And, you know, as I was preparing for this, I was debating what order to do the three, and you've just made me decide I'm going to flip it. 
uh, because it segues so um, beautifully. And I'm not gonna share the screen because it's literally three words. It is clear to me from reviewing all, all of the conversations I've had, it's, I, I've long known this and it just, it just um, reinforces it more clearly that community is essential, that resilience is, you know, I gave that image earlier of the twig, but that twig is part of a larger tree and the tree is usually part of a larger forest. And there was an amazing article a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times about how the trees communicate to each other that it, it, that there's, it is an ecosystem that is um, depend, inter, interdependent and interconnected. And that is so true for us as well. There is, um, even before the pandemic, there were, were concerns uh, uh, um, around the world, especially in westernized, um, highly industrial cultures about concerns about an epidemic of loneliness. The US Surgeon General actually issued a warning about it. And so it's a scourge that the pandemic has only intensified. And it is really clear that this connect, what, what, what Eileen just described is so, or this gathering, the, the, the Shabbat services that Osa Shalom has been doing all along, this kind of retreat gathering is so essential in terms of um, cultivating resilience. One of the books that I read when I first started learning about resilience is this amazing uh, book by two Yale professors. Um, and one of the things that they, throughout their entire study of, of um, resilience, they were looking at the um, American servicemen who were um, prisoners of war in Vietnam. And they and who were and John McCain was a really amazing example of them. How incredibly resilient they were throughout their captivity and after they came home. And they were looking to learn the lessons of living in such a, such a situation of duress and how to keep your your brain and your mind and your spirit healthy. And they found that um, um, they all knew Morse code and they worked out a system of tapping on the pipes. That connecting their cells, and so so such a such an incredible example of that. And we know, and one of the ways that I really, um, you know, we reconstructionists, we are both um, nurturing a, 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 a particularistic community and participating fully in the American, the larger American, or it, it, folks who live in Canada and other countries in the larger environment. One of the ways that one of the most important things I think that we bring from our particularistic, our Jewish piece to the wider world is our sense of community. And when I was saying earlier in this in this session, you know, we want to allow people to um, not feel forced by uh, into practice that they don't care that, they, that that doesn't resonate with them. But the place where I push the hardest, and I think we are um, called to push the hardest, is coming together to support the, each other in community, certainly in times of pain and loss, like in Minyan. And the, the thing is that if we're able, if, if we're part of that community and can provide mutual support for the hardest times, that means that we're also available for each other to celebrate and to, um, to share our, our, our deepest joys along with our greatest losses. So I think, and within the Reconstructionist, approach, we're always trying to listen to and raise up the needs of the individual, respond to it within community, and with this awareness that that means the community is alive and evolving and is going to have to change. If we're going to make space for every individual to feel most fully themselves, we have to be open to changing that which is challenging or painful or even oppressive. One of the things that the Reconstructionist Movement is increasingly leaning into is work on racial justice and understanding that there are certain ways that we, we enact white privilege that we don't intend to. There are certain ways that we are exclusionary that we don't mean. There's learning that we have to do to, to achieve the justice that we want, to extend the welcome that we want. Um, and, and, and I feel entirely confident that we're up for that kind of learning. So I think I, I mean, I was going to invite examples. Eileen just narrated an absolutely beautiful one. Is there a, anyone else who wants to share about ways that community helps, has helped them, helped you feel um, most fully yourself and 
able to be your best self and able to orient toward hopefulness and toward the future. Uh, Mary Rita, absolutely. Uh, just brief, I, I think that COVID has given me a richness and a gift because um, of some of the studying and training in, that I'm doing now, I'm able to connect with other communities. And I <clears> think that it's like, it, and, they, and those connections come at the right time when I need them. And yes, I am blessed with our Friday night uh, Shabbat and some, and the, the connections with Ose and the connections with other Jewish communities around um around the U.S. that have been really, really powerful that we can do because of Zoom now, and I'm uh, really grateful for that. It's very interesting what you just raised. One of the things that we are learning in COVID is that geography is no longer uh, destiny, you know, and that if, if everybody, if you're open to using electricity on Shabbat, um, you can Zoom. I mean, I have Zoomed in to congregations in Montreal, in, 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 and these are places I visited. I've, I've been in, in the room with them, but in the last 44 weeks, I to Northern California, Southern California, I'm gonna be in Malibu next month. What that I were really in Malibu. Um, uh, um, and, and so what, what we mean by community and how we foster community face-to-face, -face, like in the retreats that you will do next year, and then also in this kind of context is um, that's something when, what, that we're really chewing on and um, we, we see exactly all of the positives um, that, that you've just named. And there are some downsides that, that we're, we're committed to not being too anxious about um, and trying to just and, and working to make certain that we find the best possible balance between in what, what we say sometimes is in land, on land and online um, and, and to hit the, the best possible balance. Anybody else who wants to share? Uh, uh, Holly. Go ahead. Um, it kind of has to do with what uh, the first idea about rituals and then the idea of the community is that I think we've all probably all been to a funeral online and a shiva online. And I had said to a friend who uh, lost her child um, that it must have been terribly difficult because I remember when my father died, um, they were part of a, a conservative congregation. Every morning and every afternoon, the entire family got together to say prayers. And it was so healing. And after 11 months, I really could say goodbye to my dad. And every day we were able to gather as a family. And it was, it was, it was the first time I went, oh, rituals. There's a reason, there's a healing, it's so great. When my mother passed 20 years later, there wasn't the matriarch making us all go to services. It took so much longer to reach a point of closure. And so I said to my friend, who lost her daughter in April, how difficult that must have been to not be able to gather for closure. We hadn't all gotten sophisticated about Zoom yet, really. And she said, actually, she was able to see her relatives that were in Oregon and in Florida and in Hawaii because of Zoom. And she would, they would have never had that ability to have that community get together. So it's like, what we think is happening isn't always accurate and that still um, there's ways to get there. It's different, it, but different doesn't mean better or worse. It's just different. So I think it's such a, it's so powerful that you brought that. And um, I'll say two things. One is um, one of the things that I've heard, because I have done, I have led several Sheva Minion for different people. Um, one thing that people, in addition to being able to draw everyone together, also that the focus of a Shiva minion is so exclusively on the person who has died and that there's, there's a real opportunity for everybody there to get to, to know that person more deeply than they might have in, in, in a, in a non-virtual Shiva minion. And, um, I, I, I deeply, I've had conversations with many colleagues 
I think post COVID that Shiva going forward will include even even as it will be amazing to be able to allow people to reconvene in homes, to bring food, to have the side conversations that include jokes and and stories and the like. I think that there will be a virtual shiva. Virtual shiva will continue. We'll get reintegrated into that for precisely that benefit that you just named, Holly. I think that that's one of the ways um, that we, we, we will, that's a learning um, that we will take out of this season. Um, I think the key word that people are, haven't said yet is hybrid. Everything is gonna be hybrid. We are sitting here right now, participating here, and we're also participating in one of our oldest friends, Bat Mitzvah right now on another screen over here. So that's <laughs> in California. It's really rather amazing, you yeah. know? When, and, you know, we are very blessed because we can still hop in our car every afternoon and, and be at the ocean. Yeah. And then, you know, we're back here again, but, you know, we were there. So, yeah. Yeah. And you've just I named it. Say. And you've named it, Eric, that you are part of multiple communities and that you're able to plug into the, I know how beloved Osa Shalom is to, the, to, the, to you guys, and that you're also able to participate in this other community. And, and that's, that is um, that that I think is there's a there's a sweetness and and there's there's a fuller opportunity to um, bring those communities to life. And I'm sure you many of you have experienced this. Like my I have a group of friends from middle school, and we're all kind of in touch with each other through a network. But we came together in a Zoom screen, and um, and I've heard people say that they've been doing it, um, you know, on a very regular basis. That 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 th that networks are being vitalized and communal connections are being strengthened. So I have an eye on time and I think, uh, it looks like Nikki really wants to speak and, and, um, and I, I don't know if anybody else on the other screen does. So I promise it'll just be a very quick- Take your time, it's okay. No, no, so, so Mary Rita had mentioned, you know, just the every Friday, the Shabbat service and that's sort of like a ritual. For me, I'm really enjoying it um, because to go with your point, Rabbi, um, the, you know, geography is not limiting. We live um, an hour away from the synagogue, which we will gladly travel to, to be with everybody. <laughs> but this is really nice to not have to sit in the traffic. Um, but it's, it's interesting because the community that we see now on the screen, we get to see everybody's faces where when we're sitting in the synagogue, we're seeing the backs of people's heads. And so this has really been nice to see the smiles or to see the reactions of people's faces when, you know, the rabbis are giving their drosh or, or um, when people are singing. And so, I don't know, there's, there's a, that we, we, I guess maybe that's a piece of gratitude that, that we take away every Friday from the Shabbat service. Yeah, I was um, reading about, I think it's such a great point. I, I was reading about a uh, congregation not in our movement where they shut down the chat because they wanted the focus and, and, and during Shabbat services because they wanted the focus to be on the service. And in my experience, certainly from my minion, Dorshe Derek here in Philadelphia and in, in, a, in a lot of um, the communities that I visited, the chat is the richest part of the service and the opportunity to um, connect with each other um, without anybody shushing you, you know, and, um, and, and, I, and it, so, so the idea of the service without the chat just seems like, um, well, I'll just say it in the affirmative. All these ways, and you said it so beautifully, Nikki, that this there, there is, even as, oh, you know, how amazing it'll be to sing with each other and to, and to get that energy that we get when we're, when we're reinforcing, there are incredible ways of, of, build, of building up community. So any, 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 anyone? Just kind of wonder what the, because we're all using Zoom, can you imagine if this had been 20 years ago without this technology, the societal, the economic disruption, the personal disruption, as bad as it, as it is now? Wow. Barry, I think about that all the time, all the time. We would have uh, figured out ways to deal with it though. I think you're right, John. It's true. And yeah, it's true. We would have figured ways out. But I, I, uh, as much as I miss people in, in three dimensions, I'm not lonely, you know, like, that, like I, I'm so grateful for that. Um, Diane, I didn't did you mean to minimize the value of the technology. I'm just saying it isn't necessarily an either we have Zoom or we die sort of thing. Yeah, 
you make the point that we are resilient and we would be creative. I think you're exactly yep. right. I think you're exactly right. Diana, do you want to say anything? Oh, Just sorry. sort of backing up on what other people said with the Zoom, we've also had like a, a death of a family friend recently and then our best friend in the spring and everything was on Zoom because we couldn't go to the different funerals, but we watched and then we went to the Shiva. My husband read the eulogy on the on the Zoom Shiva, there were maybe a hundred squares of people at the at the Shiva. But recently when the other family friend passed away, we did our own, and they're not Jewish, so they don't do Shiva, but we watched the funerals at the little funeral home, but then we did our own family Zoom with the relatives from around the country so we could sort of reminisce and show pictures they held up to the screen that we had of this person who uh, we, we knew our whole life. So that was nice. And the, the other thing you were talking about, the chat, it's sort of like when you're texting, except you might not have their text numbers because I'll be watching something with my sisters and we might be texting back and forth or like this, you could chat back and forth. So that is a nice connection. Yeah, it's kind of, this catapulted us forward in our skills and our capacity. It's possible that you guys would have figured out to, 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 to gather together after, the, after that beloved person had died. But, but we're so used to doing it now that of course we're gonna do it now. And, 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 we're, and we're filled up by it. It, it, it's com it comforts us and, and it helps us move forward. So I'm gonna move us to the last piece. Um, and I don't know that we'll have time to do a grad the, the, the actual practice, but I, at least I can, I'll, share, I'll narrate it a little bit. Um, the last thing that I want to share um, is, and this again comes out of the resilience literature, and I, it's been reinforced in my conversations with people, that these affirmative practices, gratitude, love, an orientation toward love, forgiveness, they can be cultivated. We have... However, our personalities were, I don't know if you've, any of you have seen Jazz, the new Disney movie, it's really lovely. And they talk about like what the, it's a, it's a fanciful um, imagining of what our baseline personalities are when we're born. And, oh, soul, thank you. Thank you, Heidi, that you're exactly right. A lot of, a lot of jazz in it, but it's called soul. Um, um, whatever, whatever our baseline is, we can, through practice, that first point, cultivate um, uh, um, practices that help us move beyond or move toward, move toward what we want to magnify in the world, that letting go of hurts and opening our hearts to love and cultivating gratitude. The research, the research literature all emphasize that all of these things bolster our spiritual capacity and even our physical well-being. That um, when we're talking about gratitude in particular, people who are more grateful tend to be in physically better health, um, have access to more energy, um, are able to overcome challenges more easily. And um, so some of the most powerful conversations I've had uh, on the podcast have been certainly around the high holidays and talking about tshuva, about repenting ourselves, about forgiving other people, about letting go of terrible pain, whether it was overtly caused by people or whether it's just what the universe visits on us. This last high holiday, I spoke with Rabbi Margot Stein Azen about the death of her, her oldest son. And, um, and, and the episode, I mentioned this in my introduction, um, uh, that uh, I, one of the most popular episodes has been my conversation with Rabbi Sheila Peltz Weinberg, who is often also, you know, offers up many of the commentaries below the line in Kol and Shema. And she taught about all the ways that Judaism places love at the center of our daily lives. She was talking about, both about God's love for us and our love for God. And, you know, her her, her ultimate point was that we can express and experience love, this kind of love um, most powerfully through our intentional interactions with each other. So I want to um, open it up for conversation for maybe about five minutes and then um, end, end with um, sharing um, my, my own gratitude practice supported, like emerged out of 
uh, emerging out of Jewish uh, wisdom and supported by technology. So um, uh, anyone who has an experience of really, I mean, Mary Rita spoke about it earlier about um, really intentionally cultivating a gratitude practice. And I can't remember who it was and you've moved around a little bit on my screen, but um, some, I think some, someone mentioned going to bed and feeling grateful every single night. And the bedtime Shema, which I have said every night, I haven't been very, very sick, I think, for the last oh, 30 years um, to, as, a, as part of my efforts to ritualize uh, my bedtime and, and make it more likely um, that I'll sleep, um, is, begins with um, forgiving anyone who's wronged. Like it, because it's, it, it's in the first person singular. And it says, I forgive every, anyone who's wronged me in any of these ways. And the nights that I, sometimes I, I'll, start, I'll start saying and I'll say, you know, do I, am, am I really, really ready to forgive? Um, but, but just that engagement, um, which sometimes keeps me up a little bit longer and more often really helps me to untangle and unwind and move toward sleep, which is so renewing. So Heidi, I see your hand. And I'm gonna to try to toggle back and forth the screen. Heidi and Dan, and if there's anybody who hasn't spoken also, we'll make space. So. One word that helps me get to gratitude is perspective. Um, um, I'll give just a short story. At the end of my yoga practice, we spend a moment in gratitude. And one day my practice got so interrupted by people coming to the door and I got very irritated and then I, I switched my thinking to a different perspective saying, look, it, it, this was, these people coming to the door were trying to fix something in my house. And I changed the perspective to, to I have insurance. I have enough money to have insurance. I have people who can come to my door and fix things. And, and just by changing that perspective, all of a sudden I was grateful for it instead of being irritated. So I find changing your perspective can help find gratitude. And that is resilience. That is an expression of resilience. Like where we go from this place of like, it is costing me or I am injured or I don't have enough or whatever the, whatever the, 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 the words that, that, that you're experiencing into that space of like, it's okay, this is, there is, there's another way of being. That is that twig springing back, whether the pressure is something like loss or you know, COVID or, or just that moment of, of real contraction and moving into a more expansive place. So I said, Dan, next. Yeah, I, I, I feel the need to also mention that however stressed we are uh, and our um, anxiety, our losses and all that, I think we should keep in mind there are many, many, many people that have um, life-changing um, challenges, whether they've lost their job whether they have no money to pay electric bills uh, or water, um, they, um, have, uh, they have to stand in a food line. Um, uh, they were rounded up for being undocumented. Uh, they're in jail because they can't pay a speeding ticket. Um, you know, any number of things which have happened over the past few years and now uh, made worse by COVID um, people that don't have health insurance and can't um, uh, take care of themselves or anything. Uh, it is very hard for them to be um, resilient. It's very hard to say everybody can and should be resilient. Uh, but it also uh, reminds me to, be gra to have gratitude for what we do have and whatever stresses um, we're under. Uh, we got nothing compared to what uh, many people go through. Absolutely. I mean, two, two, two comments. One is, um, I was speaking, uh, some of you may know Abe Klott, uh, was a longtime leader in the Reconstructionist Movement, and he's a judge in New York City. We were speaking right before New Year's, and he was saying that one of the most painful things is that he's seeing, and this is, um, uh, there's a lot of evidence to, to suggest that this is this is quite widespread, that people who were barely hanging on, that this is pushing them over the edge, you know, and that, and that, 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 that and, and, and I heard this unbelievable statistic earlier this week, that there were 147,000 job losses in the month of December. They were all women. They were all women, 
mostly women of color, all of them working class. So, you know, folks who were already on the edge being kind of sent over the cliff. So that's huge and painful and something that structurally, you know, societally, we really are going to have to attend to. And Dan, I think it's right that like we, we, all of us, even, even some, I saw the chat, we had that, that we have the internet access, that there's so much privilege that we have. And like all of you, I'm sure, you know, lots of doing lots of reading to try to understand more deeply what was going on last week at the Capitol. And Thomas Edsel, who, who, who wrote an, an amazing piece in the New York Times, Sorry, I'm, and that's, I used to live in New York. That's, I'm still really oriented toward the Times rather than the Post. Um, and he talked, he was talking about that it's about, it's certainly about racism. Um, and it's, there's with a hefty dose of um, sexism and, um, and, and, the, the, and there's a class piece in there. And at one, of, one of the many points he made was that actually the people of color Ten, and people who are poorer tend to be far more resilient than, than people of privilege who have lost some of their privilege. So that, that, that so, and to me, the takeaway there is that it's on us really to cultivate our resilience and to find ways so that sm small things really don't shake us that much because big things, big, big, because we're living in a time of big things and that there are huge numbers of people who are really suffering so that we have the resources available to, to help them um, re regain a sense of well-being and a sense of wellness. Um, Can I ask a quick question? Yes. You mentioned the bedtime Shema. Is that like a, a, a set? Are you talking about someone's own prayer or is there an actual bedtime Shema? So Judaism teach. So Judaism teaches that we say, like the, the Jewish tradition, if you do a maximalist practice, if, if you're praying three times a day, you would say the Shema in the morning and the evening, and then you would also say it at, at, at nighttime, before you go to bed. And there is, if you look at a, a, an Orthodox prayer book, like Art Scroll, it's like five or six pages, it's a lot. And in the Reconstructionist daily prayer book, it's, it's, it's uh, boiled down to four paragraphs. And the first, and the first one is about forgiveness, and the se and the second one is about is about sleep, and the, and then it's the Shema, and then it's about and then the last one is the Hashkivenu prayer, a prayer for safety at nighttime. And I don't have the book in front of me, but it's toward the back of the book. Um, uh, so if if uh, I'm looking up the pages now. <laughs> great, thanks, Mary Rita. So. Okay, we have five minutes before I know we're going to go. Any, any other comments? And, and, I'll, and, and if not, I'll share. Uh, Neil. Uh, you, you are mute. Did you want to say something? Neil? Neil, did you want to add? I'm sorry, I must have misunderstood that you wanted to speak. Okay. Uh, so, George. Yeah, the one the one uh, thing that I haven't heard mentioned in the in the hour practically is the connections that we have with the natural world, and uh, I reflect on this because it's a ritual that I have now reinforced within myself each morning. I'm an, I'm a morning person, and so to go to the end of the driveway to get the morning paper and walk the dogs used to just be a another chore, something else that I had to impose before I could move on with my day. And now I walk slowly and I look around and I would venture to say that rituals are all great and community is, is absolutely invaluable for our strength and for our, our looking forward. But I think that there's something about the contemplativeness, the peacefulness, even the introspection that we can't really experience when we are amongst others that is really, really important to create additional positive energy within all of us. So I would you know, su suggest that a connection with the natural world is, is really a critical part of resilience. You are so right. Um, and for sure, all of the, um, the resilience literature reinforces that. that and, and, and there's so many, my, my wife was an incredible gardener um, likes to talk about um, that this, her favorite piece of research is that there is bacteria, there's friendly bacteria in dirt that helps to make us happier. Um, and you know, for her, 
every spring, you know, she's just covered in, in, in mud, you know, like and in, in, in dirt. And she's like, look, but I'm, I'm, I'm bringing about my happiness. And, um, and they say also that if you have the opportunity to go and be near water for like at least 15 minutes a day, that's so much uh, that, that being outside. And I think that for me, one of the things, so this is that, that, it, that absolutely exists within the Jewish canon. And it's, you know, it's, it, when you think about all of the biblical imagery, you know, earlier today in services, Mary Rita let, you know, pointed us toward Esai and I, and like, I lift my, raise my eyes to the mountains. So much of, especially the, our biblical, the, the, the things we've taken from, from, from the Bible have this natural orientation. And so much of my experience of Judaism is the more um, exilic experience of kind of the headiness and of being in books. And so I feel like my personal work is very much about um, I think I, you know, I went, I, I, just a little bit of biography. When I, in my 20s, I was trying to figure out, did I want to get a, my a PhD or did I want to be a rabbi? And I thought that I made the decision to, 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 to choose to be, become the rabbi. And it turns out I was just sequencing them. And I got the rabbinical degree first, and then I went and got the doctorate. I'm so glad I did that because, because, it, because I feel like if I had just gotten the doctorate, if I had to do a self-portrait, I would be like a very big head on a stick body. And what being coming the rabbi, choosing the rabbinical path first is that it cracked my heart open um, and that I feel like I'm able to like, you know, to bring a heart centered practice along with the, all the, the headiness of Jewish studies. And that part of our work right now, and I think resilience is part of it, is also the embodied piece of it. And I really appreciate, I didn't always do it, but the way that Mary Rita said, get up and move around and to bring our fullness. And I think George, your point about being outside, it, it just, um, it, you know, it gets, it, it, especially when we're living online, it gets us up and out and, 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 and nourishes us in ways that we can identify and in ways that we don't even know. So it, I, I'm looking at my clock. Um, I don't, we don't have time to do, oh, Heidi saying five more minutes. Are we, um, are we, we can, I can end it now and we can just not do the gratitude practice. So it's your call. We have two or three, if we could, you know, even just teach it to us if we can't. Okay. So let me share my seat screen really, really quickly. Um, wait, let me, let me set it. Ugh. Again, so great and so hard. Um, okay. That should make it easier. Zoom, share screen, Modani. Um, and I can I can share this. Um, for me, I try very hard every day to chant Modani. Um, uh, with um, and 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 I hear and, and and let me drop into the chat. Um, I let me drop into the chat a link. To, to what I, to this, um, to, to this, to this handout, if you um, want to spend some more time with it. Um, I use, and it, 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 it's on this document, Chef of Gold has an app you have to pay for it. It's about $5. I cannot tell you how worth it it is. She has a, more than 60 different melodies from Moda Ani. Um, so this is 79 now. <laughs> oh, is it? So it's, it's gone up a little bit. I, I assure you, it, I, I, I would pay it again. Yeah. Um, and she, so, and, and my wife and I, so, so, so here's technology that supports this daily practice. Um, the tradition teaches that it's the first thing you're supposed to say when you get up before anything else, that you want to orient yourself toward gratitude. I was teaching this once to someone who was raised Orthodox, and he went to an Orthodox boarding school, and he said they used to, the boys used to race each other, who could say it first, and that he'd never thought to ask what it meant. It was all about, um, like, form and never about content. And w one day while we were chanting it, my, my wife said to me, what do you mean when you're saying this? And, and I knew she was not asking, what do, what do the words mean? But what did I personally mean? So I, I, I spent about, it took me about three days to give her this, give her an answer. And, um, and this, what this handout does is share a whole bunch of different translations. Um, Art Scroll is a very literal one. 
um, and I looked at conservative and reform and reconstructionist um, and, and Shefa's translation. And you'll see they're, 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 they're very overlapping and there's some really, really interesting difference, differences, including whether you, whether you wanna use melech and translate as king or sovereign or source, or whether you wanna use ruach, which is what she does. And it's a practice that I follow as well and, and translate as a spirit. This handout has a little bit about um, how, how to have, what, what I mean by God, because for many people, especially outside of the Reconstructionist community, if they don't believe in a personal God who intervenes in history, they have a hard time saying these words. And so I give them a couple of um, paragraphs that opens up the possibility of a non-supernatural, of a transnatural understanding of the divine. Um, and, if, and, 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 and frequently what I will do is um, um, I, I, share, I share my, my definition, my, my, um, my, what I mean, my, my translation, my interpretive translation. And, and so, which I'll share with you now. So again, not the precise words, but how I, what I mean, what I intend when I say them. Moda ani lefanecha, that gratitude creates expansiveness. Ruach vekayam, there is an abiding spirit that undergirds and animates the universe. Shehechazarta bi nishmati bechemla, literally it means that you've returned my soul to me with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, in abundance. And so what I mean by that is every morning I wake up as a gift. Rabbi emunatecha, how great is your faithfulness? And this is where it really comes together. The reality that the universe is greater than we can possibly understand it, whether or not we acknowledge that orients us toward abundance. So all of that more concisely that what I mean when I'm saying moda'ani is I'm grateful source of life for another day and for the possibility of abundance. And when, when, it, when, when this is the main thing that we're doing rather than the, the, the harvesting the lessons, and, and when we're in person, um, I, I will break folks into chavruta and invite people to come up with their own translation and, and or to come up with a mantra language that helps people to formulate their own gratitude practice. So um, the, the thing that I put into the link um, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is, is, that, is that handout I just gave you, if that is helpful or useful to you. Um, and we can either end it now or we can end with one of Shefa Gold's um, chants. So Heidi's saying we should end it now. Thank you so much for, um, for this really, really rich conversation and for all you're doing. I hope the rest of the retreat is so sweet um, for all of you. I'm so glad I was a part of it. Thank you so much. Deborah, we can't thank you enough. Thank uh, the perspective and what you've given us with the mindfulness that we now can carry forward and the ritual is going to make give us the tools we need to get through. Thank you so much. So glad. Thank you so, so much, Rabbi Deborah. It's such a pleasure to study with you and from you and with everybody here. As I just put into the chat, she left us with a cliffhanger. This is our challenge. What do we want to do with this practice? So reach out to us. Rabbi Josh and myself, and we will coordinate and find a time to, uh, to continue.